Amen. The Bible says this, the book of Luke, the 16th chapter of Luke, starting with the 19th verse. It says, there was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fair sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into the Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father, Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that they would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. If I have five brethren, that, they, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear him. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. My text this morning is, Don't forget the less unfortunate. Don't forget the less unfortunate. Father, we thank you that you have brought us together today, O oh God, to lift you up, to worship you, to praise you, to exalt you, and to magnify you, and to glorify your holy name. Lord, we sense your presence, the weightiness of your importance, O oh God. We bless you and thank you that you've given us the very breath in our bodies to breathe this morning, the eyes to be able to lift up, look up to heaven, and to lift up our hands unto you, O oh God. Blessing you and praising you for all the wonderful things that thou hast done and the wonderful things that you would do. We thank you, Father, for the word that will go forth today, not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and the power. Hide me behind the cross, not about me, but all about you. Let no flesh glory in your presence. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing, and the words I speak, they are spirit and their life. In Jesus' name, let the church say amen. You may be seated. The Bible says that in this story about this rich man, it starts out by saying that there was a, a rich man, it was a rich man, but it doesn't really give a name of this rich man, it just says that he was, uh, uh, there was a certain rich man, and he was clothed in purple and fine linen. This was a highballer. This was a man who had plenty of the word rich there means that there was abundance, that was wealth, and not just rich in having things, because riches will eventually run out, but when you got wealth, it's from generation to generation. So this was abundance, this was wealth, and, and this man had uh, dressed himself nice every single day. The Bible says that he was clothed in purple, signifying that, that there was royalty, and then he had fine linen, meaning that his undergarments were that good, good stuff, that nice, fine stuff kind of pants, and if he lived today, the kind of pants he have on would have silk lines, and his jackets would have silk on the inside of them. Everything that he had would be tailor-made. He was that kind of man. He was a highball, a high roller. He had lots of money. A lot of us want to be that way. We want to be high, 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 high rollers and high ballers. The people get the lotto, win the lotto, and they get And that's why people play a lotto, because they're trying to be rich. They want to be, have all this stuff. They, they want the pleasantries of life. They want the dainties of life. They want to be clothed in the best 
material or clothing that money can buy. Amen. And, you know, if he had cars in, 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 during that time, he would have these expensive cars. I'm not talking about Rolls Royces. I'm not talking about Bentleys. Those are expensive cars, but those are $250,000 cars. Those are $300,000 cars. I just, just out of curiosity, I said, let me just Google. What's the 10 most expensive cars in the world? Because I, I didn't know they have any clue because I thought Rolls Royces and Bentleys were, were it. But my, my understanding got uh, open uh, when I Googled this. There's a car known, and you, some of you may be aware of this. It's called the, the Koenigsegg. Koenigsegg. I'm probably mispronouncing it, but it's $1.8 million. $1.8 million. This kind of car this man would have had because he had all his money. There's a car known as the Lycan, L-Y-K-A-N. It's $3.4 million. We've all heard of Lamborghinis. They're $1.5 million. You heard of Bugattis, they're 2.5 million. Those are expensive cars. You know, these, these, these athletes and some of these, these famous people, they have those kind of cars. They don't even drive them. They're just in the garages. They just sit and they just say, I got a Bugatti. Yeah. I think, I'm not mistaken, the Bugattis, they don't even drive them to the parking lot. You order them and they bring them to your house and unload them right in your driveway. It's that kind of car. This man was a highballer. You believe that? There, there's a car, well, you've heard this, the Aston Martin. It's $3 million. Listen, just one more, I'll mention one more to you. McLaren was three, is $3.7 million. That man had that kind of money. This man, you know, was a man who, uh, you hear about some of these people got, got $95 billion. Some of these Arabs got all this money. You know, just money, money, money. They never run out. So this man was that kind of man that he never ran out. And so he had all this nice, good stuff. He was the kind of person that every day when he got up, he had a chef to, free, to fix food for him. Every day he got up and he had these robes and, and you know what, he, all he had to do was hold his arms out and people would dress him. Can you imagine that? Who wants to, who, who, you, some, you want to live like that? Some people want to live like that. You know, uh, 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 you know he, 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 he had somebody clean his house every day and every time he turned around, somebody was dusting and cleaning and, 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 and preparing the finest food for him every single day. The Bible says that he felt sumptuously. I had a friend, uh, that uh, worked on Wall Street, and he was an investment banker, and he was different from us. He grew up with us, but he was a little bit different, always a little bit different. When we, he come home from college, he went to school in Minnesota. When he come home from college, he always went to Neiman Marcus and Buckhead and Shaw. He didn't have any money. Whatever his parents gave him for Christmas, he took every dime, he went to Neiman Marcus and he shopped. And he'd go there, he'd buy expensive suspenders and suspenders, and he'd buy expensive ties and overcoats and things like that. So when he graduated from college, and I don't know where he got that mindset from, because we all came from the same thing, but sometimes, you know, it doesn't matter where you come from, God will give you a vision for something that's different from anybody else. But he was that kind of, he was that kind of person. He was the kind of person that wore those things called, what do you call them, scorts? Like, like men, like, like, y'all know what I'm talking about, the scorts that, that Scott, Scottish people wear, those, he wears stuff like that. He's a big guy, he's 6'2", about 230 pounds, and he wears stuff like that. And I say, where in the world, you ain't going to wear me with that stuff on. But that's the kind of person he was. So one day we were at his house. He, he moved back here from New York. Uh, and he moved out in, in Buckhead off Roxborough Road. And uh, he, he was out there. And I was at his house one evening after work. And uh, Federal Express came. And Federal Express came and came and had an envelope, a package about like this. About like this. Only about, about two feet long and maybe about 18 inches wide. And he said, oh, that's my suit. I said, suit? How do you get a suit in a package that size? He said, well, you know, when I was in New York, I met this tailor, and he made all my suits, so he has my, all my, my, my dimensions, and so he makes his suits, and he sent them to him, so whenever I get ready for a new suit, he just, he, he, he had one made, he sent it. And it was kind of, he, he took that suit out, I couldn't believe it was a suit, I couldn't believe that you could take a jacket and fold it that small, I couldn't believe you take a pair of pants, he's a big guy, and, sm and, and fold it that small, but he, he fit that suit in that small package, because of the type of material it was. It was that kind of wool that, that, that was so fine that uh, not, the, not that we go to a store and we can get the 100, 120 fine wool or we can go and get 150. This was beyond that. This man, this, this, this guy ordered these suits. And I don't know what he paid for them. I ain't asking. But it was the kind of, I said, well, it was so wrinkled. I said, well, how in the world? When you got sent to a dry clean and just get the wrinkles out of it? He said, no. He said, I'm going to hang it up. And in two days, the wrinkles will fall out of it. It's that kind of suit. Listen, that suit doesn't compare to what this man was wearing. This man felt something that had the fine linen. 
Amen. See, some of us can dream about stuff like that, but there are people who live like that all the time, every, every single day. I don't, I don't know anything about that kind of living. My wife and I had, had, had the pleasure and the experience of, of going nice places uh, before President Obama uh, took office. Uh, they allowed executives to go on these nice vacations, the company paid for them, and we went to some nice places. And you know what? It was something for us to go to breakfast and, and, and for the company to pay uh, $150 for a breakfast. That was, that was good. We thought we were high rollers. We thought we were big balls. We go to, uh, we, did, we, we, we went had an event in, in Las Vegas, and we stayed at Bellagio, and in the Bellagio Hotel, everything was, was gold and all this kind of stuff. We thought we were high ballers. We thought we were high rollers. We thought we were, we felt good about ourselves. We were humble about it because we said God was doing it, but we enjoyed ourselves. Amen? Listen, that didn't compare to this. This is a different kind of life. The Bible says, but it's interesting here, it says that, that there was a rich man, right? But it doesn't give us the name of the rich man. And, and, and I'm going to explain to you why I believe uh, his name is not mentioned here. But the Bible says that, that there was also a certain beggar, and this beggar's name was Lazarus. Not the Lazarus to be confused with the Lazarus that was raised from the dead, not Martha and Mary's brother, not that Lazarus, but a different Lazarus. Lazarus' name means God the helper. Amen? But it says that he was a beggar. He says that every day he was laid at the gate. Somebody took him and laid him at the gate every single day. Somebody took him and put him there because they themselves didn't have the resources to do what they needed to do for him. So they took him and they laid him at this gate and laid him at the gate because this man was rich. And they assumed that because he was rich, he would do something good for him. Amen? So every day they take him and, and they lay him, lay him at his gate. And the Bible says uh, that this man was desiring to be fed just from the crumbs from the man's table. You believe that? I, you know, I, I can only imagine that, that when they prepared food for this rich man, that they had just a, a, a table just full of food. And he could just choose from whatever he wanted. And I'm sure the servants were able to enjoy themselves and everybody else in the house. But I'm also sure that even after all that, there was still some food left over that he could have given to somebody else. But the Bible doesn't say that he gave him anything. It says that he was desiring, meaning that there was ongoing desire for him to want to be fed just from the crumbs. Listen, I don't know about you, but I, I know what it feels like. I know what it's like to be without, not have as much. I, I know what that feels like. But I've never been to the point where I, I, we, I, I thought we were poor. I, I thought growing up that we, I know we didn't have much. But this man had experienced abject poverty. I've never experienced abject po poverty. See, see, when I was growing up, I thought we were poor because I had to eat the back of the chicken. See, there was one chicken, and there were seven of us. And what bothered me was that I had the back and the gizzard. And then there were days that when my mom was eating, sometimes she'd eat a piece of the gizzard. And I'd be standing there going, you eating part of what I'm going to eat. What's going to be left for me? There's nothing on the back. Gills is on that big, two pieces to it, and she eat part of that. And I think to myself, Mama, what am I going to eat if you're going to do that? And my sister ate the breast. She always got the breast. I never understood that because she didn't even like chicken. So one day I go into church's chicken, and I said to the man, I said, uh, I want to order a back and a gills. And he said, he said, we don't serve back. Oh, I'm having a flashback. I thought I was, I'm sorry, I'm having a flashback. I forgot you don't serve back and gills us here. Listen to my first year of college, I had a chance to go to Chicago. And, and in, in Chicago, I'd never seen this before in my life. But I saw a man standing, eating out of a trash can. And when he stood there and ate out of that trash can, he was eating like he was eating off his kitchen table. I had never seen anything like that before in my life. And I said, in the car that I was riding, I said, oh my God, that man is eating out the trash can. That's when I realized, I thought we were poor, but we weren't poor, because we were poor, because we never, I never had to eat out the trash can. That's abject poverty. This man had nothing. He was desiring to be fed with the crumbs just from the rich man's table. It's amazing how we forget things. You know what we forget? We forget that when God blesses us, God's not blessing us just for us. We forget it. We forget that God isn't blessing us just for us. God's blessing us to take what he gives to us for us to use to help somebody else. God has no problem with us being rich. God has no problem with us 
uh, faring sumptuously every day. God has no problem with us driving Bugattis and these other cars. God has no problem with any of that. What God has a problem with is that we get rich and we forget him. God's not giving us anything just for ourselves. Nothing just for ourselves. And too many times, we think when we get something, we use it just for us. Not even opening our hearts and our minds to say, God, is there anybody, anybody around me, anybody that I know, anybody that I don't know that you want me to bless? And too many times, we're getting it all for ourselves and we're consuming it, consuming it upon ourselves and not asking God any time, God, what would you have me to do?